Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down threats and vulnerabilities, solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to the CyberWire's Research Saturday podcast. Today, I want to reach out to those members of our audience who are students or serve in the military. Did you know that the CyberWire has special CyberWire Pro subscription offers just for you? Well, you do now. Because of your student or military status, that's active or reserve military status, you are able to subscribe to CyberWire Pro or CyberWire Pro Plus at a significant discount. That means you can unlock access to our focus briefings, exclusive podcasts, quarterly analyst calls, premium articles, and much more. To learn more, visit the cyberwire.com slash pro and click on the Contact Us button in the academic or government and military box. That's cyberwire.com slash pro and then click Contact Us in the box that applies to you and we'll hook you up. Thanks again for listening to Research Saturday. Thanks to our sponsor, Reservoir Labs. Reservoir knows that cybersecurity teams need full network visibility to discover new threats, tactics, and behaviors. This is true today more than ever. Reservoir Labs provides solutions based on rock-solid enterprise-class network sensing and spectral hypergraph analytics, using advanced algorithms and mathematics to deliver for your team and your network. Contact Reservoir to learn how you can gain comprehensive threat visibility in minutes. Learn more at Reservoir.com slash Cyberwire. That's Reservoir.com slash Cyberwire. And we thank Reservoir Labs for sponsoring Research Saturday. I started looking at disinformation campaigns by foreign actors early last year. That's Daniel Katz. He's a senior principal researcher in the Norton LifeLock Research Group. The research we're discussing today is titled Introducing BotSight, a new tool to detect bots on Twitter in real time. Norton LifeLock, previously Semantic, has a history of looking at state-sponsored campaigns in the security space. So we look at uh, advanced persistent threats, malware that's distributed by state actors. And we had this conversation within the research group that Disinformation is very similar to these kind of threats, but it's operating in a space that doesn't have as much scrutiny from dedicated professionals. So we started looking at at the data, and this was this was the end result after a lot of work and a lot of uh, back and forth about what the best way to tackle that problem is. Well, let's walk through it together. Um, I guess, uh, can you describe to us, first of all, what is the tool that you all have released? We released a tool called BotSite. The idea of the tool is that it can flag accounts which are behaving in such a way that they're very similar to social bots. So these are accounts that uh, state-sponsored groups use to spread disinformation. Uh, So... When you install BotSite, which is available as a browser plugin for all major browsers or as an app for iOS, you can use this tool to see percentages right in your Twitter feed of the likelihood that a given account is acting as a social bot. Well, take us through what's going on under the hood here. I mean, how did your team come at this problem and and analyze the data to be able to come up with, uh, with these percentages? So uh, there's a big reservoir of data that we analyzed. We actually analyzed uh, four terabytes of past tweets that we got our hands on through uh, various sources. There's actually been a lot of academic work in this area, but it's been focused on uh, older data sets. So while we took a lot of cues from the academic world in terms of our approach, the data that we use is a little bit newer. So in the background, we have a machine learning model that takes in approximately 20 different features from a given account and calculates what is the probability that this account is a social bot. These features uh, are based on historical examples of social bots in the past. 
And this percentage is what we call uh, calibrated. So a lot of the time, machine learning models, they return just numbers between zero and one, but these don't really correspond to percentages. But we have calibrated it so that whatever percentage you see in the feed, that is the actual likelihood that that account is a social bot. Hmm. And how do you uh, how do you check against yourself in an ongoing way? I mean, how how are you making sure the I guess maintaining the integrity of uh, of this um, these evaluations over time? It's a great question. The short answer is testing. We have a lot of people now who are using this tool and who had been using this tool internally at Norton LifeLock before we released it for about five months, and people were constantly coming back with feedback. As you know, different people use Twitter in a variety of different ways. There are so many accounts in a lot of languages. Uh, Norton LifeLock is a global company, so we have employees from all over the world. And they're telling us that they're getting unexpected results here and there. And so we're constantly tuning the model for months and months before we got something that we were really, really happy with. Um, and this kind of highlights the difference between academic research data sets that we initially started using versus a real life deployment. And the real world is much more messy than the small academic data sets that uh, researchers tend to use. Hmm. Can you give us some insights on, on the types of things that you and your team had to do to, to fine tune the results? Absolutely. So one of the things that we found was that a lot of celebrities kind of behave like bots. And the reason for this is they use uh, social media management tools in order to uh, coordinate their posts. They release the same post, for example, on Instagram and on Facebook and on Twitter and on other platforms. And it looks a lot like the coordinated activity that we see and so we had to make some adjustments for, for that kind of behavior. Hmm. Another example are ad campaigns by corporations, which kind of behave in the same way. Can you give us an idea? I mean, what, what is a typical behavior that differentiates a bot from a real, a real human? So there are a few different behaviors. One is we find that groups of accounts uh, that act together in concert over a prolonged period of time, they tend to belong to a single bot network. This is very rare for humans because humans are fickle. Some days you tweet a lot, other days you don't tweet uh, at all. Um, and you don't see this long-term collaborative behavior. That's one, one thing that we've observed. Another feature that we've observed is the uh, social bots are very bad at coming up with their own organic content. They generally try to amplify, so they do a lot of retweeting. Um, and social bots, they're not, they're really not normal Twitter users. So on Twitter, you might engage with the content. You might reply to some people. You might like posts. Uh, but that kind of what we might might say passive and active engagement is actually very rare for bots. Bots tend to either retweet, that's the most common behavior, or they tend to uh, generate kind of generic tweets. They'll tweet a news story, for example. Now, I, I've uh, installed the plugin here for myself, and I've been playing with it uh, with Twitter. And uh, first of all, I have to say it is a lot of fun. So there's that <laughs> there's that element of it. Um, but it's also fascinating to to see you know these numbers scroll by. And I'm curious, you know, what, what do you anticipate being a typical use case of this? How do you ideally? How would you like it to um, to contribute to how people use the platform? a great question. I think that there's been a lot of discussion in the media about bots and fake news. And I think that a lot of people are aware of the problem that there exists these social bots on social media. But I think most people don't really have a sense of where these bots live. And this can be a little bit toxic because every time there's some odd opinion that's a little bit different, you might see on Twitter that people will call this person out as being, for example, a bot or 
a troll or something like that. Mm. And so we really wanted to contextualize where are you most likely to find bots? What are the typical bot behaviors? And we wanted to do it in a way that is very clear to the average user. You know, we can always release a paper and talk about these bot behaviors, but I think this really helps educate uh, a person in a way that is interesting, is obvious. Yeah, it's almost like you you have a, an expert sitting over your shoulder while you're scrolling through things, and you, you say to yourself, "Hmm, that that seems a little bot like." You can then you know look at the results from the plugin and say, "Hmm, yep, yep, it's, it, it it likely is." You know, someone else agrees, or or the, I guess the other direction where you can say, "No, you know what? That is probably a, a real person." Exactly, and the other angle of this is we wanted to create a sense of critical thinking about where are tweets coming from. So one of the key instigating ideas behind this tool was in early March, I think, uh, back when the U.S. Democratic primary was in full swing. I don't know if you remember it uh, because it feels so long ago, (laughs) but it was uh, a contest between uh, Bernie Sanders and uh, Joe Biden. And right when Joe Biden won the uh, South Carolina primary, there was some coverage by major publications that talked about, you know, there's a lot of anger online from Bernie people uh, that were tweeting with with certain uh, hashtags, like hashtag rig DNC, for example. Hmm. But when my colleagues and I look deeper into these trends, we found that specifically for that one, there was actually a lot of non-organic activity. So it didn't really appear that these were legitimate Bernie supporters, but were actually outside actors. And so we felt like BotSite going forward might help journalists to think about the possibility that these trends that they're seeing, they actually might not be organic. What sort of insights have you gained uh, on Twitter itself as you've been going through this process and gathering this data and and fine-tuning the tool? Do you you have a sense for where we stand when it comes to Twitter and and the ubiquity of bots on the platform? I think that we actually stand in a really good place right now, uh, contrary to to some of the coverage that you may see, because... Twitter has gone after the bots, uh, at least certain types of bots, very aggressively. And so we, from our own research, we see a marked decrease in the overall amount of bots. We call it the background radiation of bot activity on the platform from almost 20% in 2016 to around 5% currently. Uh, 5% is still a high number, but it's a lot better than where where we used to be. Uh, however, there this doesn't address other misinformation problems that our tool doesn't tackle. So for example, people retweeting misleading claims uh, is, is just something that we don't address. So for example, uh, there was a picture that people were tweeting that seemed to show an explosion in DC over the past little bit, but it turns out that this was just a still from the show Designated Survivor. And this is not something that our tool would catch unless this was sponsored by outside groups, which it doesn't look like it was. It was just organic activity. Right. So if the bots latch onto it and start amplifying it, that's something that you would detect. But the um, the truth of the post itself is not something that uh, you're you're really aiming at. Exactly, exactly. And this is both an advantage of our approach uh, and a deliberate design decision, but also something that I think that people have to keep in mind when they go on social media. So on the one hand, just because something is uh, not true doesn't mean it was posted by a bot. Uh, And secondly, just because uh, the number of bots on the platform has gone down doesn't mean that there is less false information do you have any any advice or, or things that you learned in this process? I'm thinking for the, the folks in our audience who may be working with artificial intelligence or perhaps there are students who are learning about this sort of, of thing. 
Um, are, are there any insights that you can share through going through this process? Anything that surprised you or was uh, unexpected in in using that sort of approach for this sort of uh, information and challenge? I have a few a few different insights. Well, the first one is uh, what I said before, which is that your training set may not necessarily be representative of real world data. Hmm. So our initial training set were common data sets that are used in the research community. Uh, things that uh, are data sets that people have published many academic papers on. But we found that these data sets, if you just use them to train the models, are actually not really representative of, of current use of Twitter. And whether this is because people are just using Twitter in different ways or because the data sets themselves are small, uh, I'm not sure. But it speaks to the value of uh, doing some kind of validation before you really deploy your models into the real world and being able to adjust your uh, data sets accordingly. We also did a variety of what's called cross-validation in a very specific way. There's a paper called DBOT, which talks about the use of cross-validation to make your model more uh, resilient. And the idea there is that you're specifically taking your training set and you're splitting it according to the different types of thing, in our case, bots. And you're training your classifier on, let's say you have five types of bots in your training set. You train on the first four, and then you see if your classifier can recognize the fifth type that it hasn't trained on. And this makes your model more robust, because if you start mixing in the different types of bots together in your training set, then what happens is when you encounter a new type of bot in the wild, you're not as sure that your model is going to detect that kind. Hmm. And let's say the, the final thing uh, that we really learn is that even if you have a false positive rate or a false negative rate of 1% or 2%, that can be still a lot if people are using your classifier and are really relying on it. You know, if you have, for example, 100,000 or 1 million lookups, 1% of that is a big number. Uh, and so you have to think about these percentages in terms of the anticipated volume. How do you and your team protect against your own personal biases sneaking into uh, the various uh, algorithms that you're, that you're using here? You know, how, how, do you, uh, how do you make sure and uh, guard against that sort of thing? So when people send us accounts that they think are bots or are not bots, we are very conservative. And so we apply a consensus to these examples uh, before we add them into our training set. So if we're not all sure that something is a bot or is not a bot, based on examples that someone has sent in, we don't add them. This is one of the reasons why we try to stay away from actually using the content of the tweet. Uh, and our classifier really focuses on metadata. Uh, it, it does look at the hashtags, but it looks at not what the hashtags are, but for example, is the hashtag popular? How many hashtags are there? How many mentions are there? But in terms of the actual content of the tweet, whether it's uh, political or whether it's medical, we try not to look at that uh, partially for this reason. Why was it important for you all to uh, put a tool like this out there to make it widely available for free? For me, this is deeply personal. Uh, I grew up in, uh, in Russia in the early 90s, and my parents actually met uh, handing out pro-democracy leaflets in the late 80s in the Soviet Union. And so my family background has this rich history of both experiencing a wide campaign of disinformation and misinformation and knowing the real value of objective truth. And oh, I really latched onto this issue quite strongly when when we were looking at these kind of misinformation campaigns. And I felt like this was a real positive good that we can do in the world. You know, it's very rare as technologists that we can just put something out there to really help people in an unambiguously good way. Uh, and that, that really made me excited to do something like that. 
disinformation, it, it, it doesn't just come from one side or the other. It comes from both sides at once. The intent isn't just to deceive you, but it's also to inflame tensions. It's also to divide us. It's also to play to our existing biases. So we have to be especially careful when we are on social media to question things that we see that appeal to us. Our thanks to Daniel Katz from Norton LifeLock Research Group for joining us. The research is titled Introducing BotSight, a new tool to detect bots on Twitter in real time. We'll have a link in the show notes. Our thanks to Reservoir Labs for sponsoring this week's Research Saturday. Don't forget you can learn all about them at Reservoir.com slash Cyberwire. The Cyberwire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing Cyberwire team working from home is Elliot Peltzman, Haru Prakash, Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.